All right, hey comrades. So uh, welcome, welcome to a special edition of Utopian Cartography. This is just a little. I just want to record a little thought that I had. I just got off of a conference call with um, the participant, some of the participants from Imagine Convergence, and um, we had a good conversation. And um, but I, I was struck by. So you know we we had a, had a conversation um, as a big group, and then we broke up, and then we each of the participants like made their own little sub um, sub discussion like a in the in the breakout groups, and <clears throat> I uh, I made one on on uh, transcending the market and what and trying to imagine what a sustain, truly sustainable economy would look like, and so basically my. But, but so, uh, and when I got to the group, nobody showed up. So everybody went to the other groups, which were were not policy oriented and were were more based on the ideological level, I guess. Um, and so, I feel I. Um, so I, I and I find that I find that indicative of a uh, of a major problem that we have as a movement, um, because oh, oh, they're mowing the lawn. It's, if I turn the cane down a little bit, talk a little closer to the mic. All right, so. <laughs> so it's it's becoming increasingly apparent to me that we have a big problem with not being able to translate what we're thinking into policy. Like we're, it seems like there's this whole um, train of thought that you know, and, and it started with the new left. Sorry, scratch that. <laughs> it started with the counterculture as distinct from the new left. So in, in the 60s, you know, it, it kind of, the, the, the counterculture was kind of split into two. And it, it was, one was really policy oriented and politics oriented and, you know, trying to, trying to play the game in, a, in some sense of the establishment of, because, the, you know, they, they write these laws, you know, all, all laws are is just, a, you know, somebody wrote some shit and then now everybody has to, you know, and then it has the force of law, which means that the, the government's monopoly on force can enforce it. Um, and that, <clears throat> um, and as it stands, all, as it stands, all of our laws are being writ written by corporations and billionaires and they're all, uh, that's why our world is the way that it is because these fucking billionaires are writing all the laws just to benefit them. And, and at the, at the expense of the rest of us and the planet and our, the future habitability of the earth. <laughs> so on one level I get, you know, on, on, I've, I've gone back and forth between those two, you know, approaches to, ch to changing this shit is like, whether we go, the political route and try to like get policies implemented that you know are you know more in line with our values and good you know humanist principles um and i'm also sympathetic to the idea that that's you know that's all um i don't know it's a it's a matrix that is like how people always talk about the you know you don't change the system, the system changes you if you try to go that route. And so I, I, I'm like sympathetic to it in a way, the idea of folk politics and like not actually trying to discuss policy and trying to like actually change the laws and change the way the government works. But I guess my feeling is that we're not going to get there that way. My, I just have this feeling like we're not going to like, we're on this path to we're, like science is telling us that we have a decade to deal with this shit. And, you know, like, and we're not dealing with any of it on a policy level. Like that. I, there, there was a, there was a conference uh, a few months ago in San Francisco, um, ca called like the Global Climate uh, Summit. Oh yeah, the Global Climate Summit. I think that's what it was called. 
but it was like I remember I picked up a passenger that, that was like leaving the conference and she was talking about how how you know how much, how filled with hope she is that you know that basically that corporations can deal with climate change you know that individual corporations are going to figure out a way to deal with climate change like without government action and that I just feel like is a wrong way to approach this whole shit like I, I think that um the whole idea of that we're going to be able to solve climate change without the government intervening is preposterous i just the the government i you know i you know, i'm an anarchist in a lot of ways and so i i do have a tendency to not want to like think about the government as the solution to anything or whatever but in a lot of ways it is like and the extent to which um the government is doing bad things it's doing those things on behalf of corporations it's doing the, it's doing those things on behalf of private interests rich people with billions of dollars in the bank are they own the government they tell the government what to do and that's why that's why you know the government's doing bad things <laughs> And like they, there's they, they've developed this whole ideology around oh the government's the problem, and that was one of the most clever things that business has ever done. Like they, like in the seventies, they they did the, an Aikido kind of move where they they took the anti-establishment instincts of the counterculture this the the folk politics half of of the of the movement in the 60s the and which which was primarily oriented around anti anti-authoritarianism anti-establishment whatever and so they kind of took that and flipped it into saying that the government is the establishment and you know they were doing that was during the cold war and they were doing that in contradistinction to the Soviet Union, where the government was doing a lot of things. <laughs> like, and they were, you know, they were in this Cold War with a, a communist, to whatever extent that that shit was actually communist. <laughs> Definitely dubious. But uh, at least nominally, that was the, the general project. So they, they, in trying to like prop up this fucking um, American free enterprise concept, they, you know, like through Reaganomics and all of it, and you know, I guess just Reagan in general, um, especially, but like they, they took this anti-establishment movement and kind of flipped it against the government, which is supposed to be, supposedly working for the people, that's the whole the whole distinct the whole distinction between private enterprise and the government is that private enterprise is working for itself and it's only you know working to accrue profits to itself and you know exploit everything everything outside of itself like the corporation is designed to, to be a profit maximization mechanism so what it does is you know reach its tentacles all around into everything that it can figure out how to make profit from and, uh, and extract that back into itself whereas the government is trying to manage the resources like um for the people like that's what public means it's like uh, this the the you know public enterprise is you know projects and infrastructure and institutions and things that are for the public for the people and not for profit for you know to extract into the hands of some already rich douchebags so the i, I so i while I'm sympathetic to the the uh, anarchistic kind of <clears throat> fuck the government idea, like in the short term, like 
the government's the only thing that's going to be able to stop these corporations from doing what they're doing. Like there, a lot of these corporations, like, you know, they, well, let alone the fact that they fucking get subsidies, like where our taxpayer dollars are going to straight fucking fund their profits. Like, and little aside that, but there's also just the simple principle that the uh, operating system that this whole economy, the whole social system that the government it, it implements, like that's the part that we need to hack. Like the, the idea of legislation, like the idea of getting legislation that would benefit the public into the fucking legal code. Cause you know, that that's how the civil rights movement happened. Like, you know, you can, you know, you can, in the sixties, they, you know, there, there were, you know, there were certainly people that were like, you know, all right, I assume there were people that were, you know, like trying to talk about how we could solve racism or, you know, discrimination or whatever by just persuading people, by, by just trying to persuade people, you know, in the marketplace of ideas. I'm sure there were people who thought that, but they didn't get the Civil Rights Act, you know, like the, the, a lot of the, you know, reason there's not more, you know, blatant discrimination is because the, corporations who would be doing that discrimination, like are legally prohibited from doing so. And like, and that's the only reason we have this sort of um, multicultural ethos or goal or um, ideal or any of that, like it was put into the fucking law. And so I, a lot of, I, I think a lot of what we need to do is, um, is to translate these big ideas about, you know, unity consciousness and, and the, the tribe of all life on earth and all these ideas about, um, you know, how we need to tr like treat the planet and each other with respect and that we need to, you know, follow indigenous principles and all those things like, yeah, it's good if we could do that on our own lives on a personal level, but that's what's known as lifestyle politics. And it can only go so far because we're, we're each, you know, we're just each individuals and there's no, you know, where there's millions and billions of people in the world, you know, millions in our country, I mean, and billions in the world. And so like there, anything that any of us do can only, it can only affect, you know, a small number of people because you know we each only come into contact with a small number of people relative to the population sorry hold on so anyways i guess <clears throat> so i guess i just um I feel like what we need to do is to translate these I idealistic notions of um, peace and love and unity and all and respect and all of it, all of it, not mistake. You know, like we need to encode that shit into the law. Like, and the way we do that is politics. The whole point of politics is in in, in a democracy, especially, is about like trying to figure out what what is going to be the code you know like what's the what's the platform like what's what are the rules of the game basically and if you know and you know certain things like you know like um you know market solutions like a carbon tax and all, all that shit like that that's that's just trying to like that's basically trying to i don't know um incentivize these corporations to do the right thing um i don't know i guess i just feel like 
if we don't change the fundamental structure of these organizations from, you know, profit at all costs, basically, and we should, we just have to do, you know, um, I don't know, just like, you know, I don't know, the whole point of the market economy is to convert nature into products, you know, like, I guess, uh, um, and as Charles Eisenstein says, um, convert relationships into services. So the whole idea of product, products and services, like that, that's not quite what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. Basically, <laughs> this, is, this is a lot more long-winded of a video than I meant it to be, but I, I all I really was trying to make this short, I was trying to make a short little video to, to make the point, to get to put the point out there that we got to fucking focus on policy. We got to rally around certain ideas. Like the left is, has these policies like the Green New Deal and Medicare for all and free college and ending the wars and ending the drug war and a living wage and a basic income and and even a jobs guarantee, like these policies could do re could like transform the country and make it a different place for regular people, especially poor people. Like the, we, we need to figure out how to implement these ideas on a policy level because, you know, I say I'm an anarchist in the sense that, like, I, like I'm an I'm an anarchist in the sense that I'm a like anarcho futurist, I guess. Like I I see anarchism as as a far far future goal that you know you know at, at its core level when you know if it you know, if, when if interpreted to mean the full you know no state like no you know, hierarchical regulatory apparatus. Um, that's a far future thing. Cause right now, you know, while, while we're still living in scarcity, while we don't have atomically precise manufacturing and free energy, like while we still have to extract resources from the earth to power our account, economy and to use as the substance in, in the things that we use, like, there, um, you know, it's, we need, like, 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 these corporations are gonna destroy the planet, like, they're literally gonna make it uninhabitable, like, we're, like, right now, right now, we're on track to cook the planet at four or five degrees Celsius warming by middle of the century. By 20, or by 2050 so it's like 30 years out you know like we're most of us are going to be around for that and like that's going to make parts of the earth that are very inhabited like parts of india and parts of california that there, there's lots of people <laughs> it's going to get so hot during this especially during the summers if we fucking heat the planet by four or five degrees celsius it's going to get so hot that the, the places are going to be uninhabitable. So it's just going to cause these mass waves of migration. And we're going to, we're going to see, I don't know. We Like I just listened to a really, um, I don't know, alarming uh, review of a book where they're talking about this. And, uh, and he was talking about how, you know, the Syrian civil war, uh, you know, created a million refugees that were, you know, were absorbed into Europe and that caused this whole epic reactionary backlash, Brexit and, you know, people like Trump that, that rose to power because of, because of immigration and because of people's, you know, fears of the other, like that's going to be amplified by a hundred fold by four degrees warming. You know, we're going to see a hundred forty, you know, they cited 140 million climate refugees by by 2050 there's gonna be a hundred times more 
more forced migration than than the civil than, than the Syrian Syrian civil war, which you know caused the whole entire fascist movement that we're uh, witnessing right now and trying to resist. Like the, I just feel like we're. I feel like no one is taking this shit seriously. Like no one's taking it seriously. The the peril that our civilization is in, um, and so just you know all the like, you know, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, what am I trying to say? All, all of the like, oh, we're gonna figure it out, you know, and all the like happy feelings and good, you know, good vibes about it, you know, like, like, I just feel like we're not, like, we don't have enough time to keep bucking around anymore. Like, I'm, you know, I'm still trying to, you know, I still want to go to festivals and, you know, uh, dance at Rome's bread and circuses or whatever, but, because, you know, if, like, especially if, you know, like, if we're all going to die in this like runaway climate apocalypse and ecological breakdown that, it, that it'll cause, I mean, and also it's being caused by other things too, but uh, the climate fucking getting all out of whack is definitely going to um, accelerate it. Like we're, so, you know, like, if, if that is going to happen, then, you know, I, yeah, I want to dance and have fun, too, in the meantime. But, so I, so I do think it's important to, that we balance the, the, okay, wrong, that we balance the, I don't know, um, like, I don't know, I, me I remember a long time ago, um, so there, uh, when, back when Dylan Radigan had a show on MSNBC, um, uh, in like 2011 or whatever, um, he had a guy, had a guest on that said, you know what your problem is, Dylan? Uh, Rome is burning and you're trying to put out the flames. What you need to do is start selling, mar uh, start selling marshmallows and graham crackers. <laughs> uh, and like, and he was being sarcastic, the guest was being sarcastic, obviously, because, you know, he, he, you know, he's obviously not advocating for profiteering on the end of the world, but um, he, he was, he was, uh, like, I don't know, he was joking about the fact that, you know, like, there's, you know, there, I mean, eh, maybe that's not a good example, actually. <laughs> Because, you know, in in reality, the idea, uh, yeah, maybe that's not a good example. Because what I'm advocating is that it's simultaneously, like, I think you might have said in that quote somewhere, you need to learn the pl learn to play the fiddle and start selling marshmallows and graham crackers. But like that idea of playing the fiddle is the more important part of the metaphor, I guess, is that I'm, that I'm, <laughs> that I'm advocating because it's like, you know, on, on the one hand, I do think that we should be trying to put out the fire, like, just cause, you know, I do, you know, as much, as much terrible shit that as humans do to each other and to other animals, you know, I, I do think that there is a important evolutionary significance to, human beings and especially civilization what we've been able to create with technology especially the internet and digital worlds and all that like that's i think that's a huge factor that the the general um situation of life on earth would be diminished without so i don't I, you know i like i know i definitely know plenty of people who advocate that the world would be better off without humans on it um and surely in the short term that's true like if you know but no humans versus the humans running shit today yeah no humans will be better than <laughs> better for the rest of the planet than the people we have running our civilization but i do think that like civilization is salvageable like i'm definitely not an anarcho-primitivist 
in any way. Like I think technology is the greatest thing that we've, that we humans have figured out. Like, I think it's epic and amazing and beautiful and um, the natural next stage in the evolution of life on this planet. And um, so I think it's important that humans are saved. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, and I, I think that it's important that we, um, you know, and, and not just for our own sake, but I don't know. I just, I, I feel like what we're, what we're engaged in as humans in this, this thing we call civilization, I think it's bigger than any of us. And I think it's bigger than any human. I think it's bigger than humans. I think the, what, what I think the purpose of, you know, in a hundred years after we transcend humanity, if we survive, <laughs> like, cause the, part of the way I picture it is that, you know, part of me feels like I, I, part of me, part of me has a hard time imagining humanity saving itself. Uh, um, but what I do hope is that we are still able to continue to, to develop our technology to the extent that we'll be able, that we'll be able to emulate the human brain um, in another substrate like silicon or, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, I guess basically instantiate that consciousness into, you know, robots as they continue to develop. And so I, I do think there's some, you know, I do think I, I, if I had to put money on it, <laughs> if it were a betting man, you know, I'd say that there, the most likely scenario is that humans, humans don't change their behavior in time to save the planet from making it, making to save the planet from being uninhabitable to human life. Um, and so I, and I, you know, and, but I, you know, I, I think that it's probable, I think it's likely that, you know, we'll be able to continue to develop this technology to create beings, <clears throat> create beings that can, that don't, for example, need oxygen or need food or, need to reproduce or a lot of the things that humans need like we were humans are very high maintenance creatures and so i think that you know there's i think that there's a good chance that humans will will that consciousness like advanced consciousness human level advanced sorry that human level consciousness will survive will continue to survive I, I i think that that's probably likely but i, I um even even i think that human i guess what i'm trying to say is I, I do think that human level consciousness will survive the extinction of the human race if we're able to if if humanity is able to survive long enough to see that but i you know, I have empathy for other animals. I don't think that he, humans are the only important ones. So I, so I, I, I think that it's worth trying to do everything we can to prevent this destruction of the planet, just for the, you know, just for the sake of the other animals. Um, like, you know, even, even if you don't, you know, if you don't buy the argument that humans are special, um, you know, I don't think we're categorically special. I just think we're special in terms of, how smart we are. So, some of us. <laughs> definitely not all of us. Uh, there's definitely people who are dumber than dogs. <laughs> um, but not to insult dogs, just to insult those people. Or not, I guess not even to insult those people. It's, you know, intelligence isn't all that matters. But, um, <laughs> but, Sorry, that was a, definitely a tangent I was not planning on getting into. But <laughs> my point here is just policy, 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 policy. Fuck the Democrats, like Pete, Pete, Pete Buttigieg, <laughs> uh, Buttigieg, uh, Mayor Pete. Like he's, he's been going around talking about how the Democrats are too focused on policy. Like he's going around talking about how we need to stop focusing on policy so much. <laughs> it's like, uh no <laughs> like hillary didn't have any policies 
That's why she fucking lost. Like where the 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 left is, has got to have policies. Like in order to win elections, which I know some people don't even care about because they think that the government's a problem. So they, so they think that we might as well just let idiots make up the majority of the voting electorate and just vote for vote in whoever whichever idiot they want to fucking vote in and because it'll be just as you know it'll be the difference between a good you know a good president or a good you know mayor or legislator or assembly assembly person or congress person like the a lot of people think that the difference between a good one and a bad one is barely in, is negligible anyways I, I don't think that's true. I mean, I couldn't guarantee you that it's not the case. <laughs> um, so, but I just feel like there's a dangerous, dangerous depoliticization happening. Um, I mean, and it's been happening since, since the seventies, since that, um, since they did that, you know, move of, you know, creating rebels without causes basically like to, to create rebels against the very notion of institutional power rather than rebels against the institutional power that is making everything suck like there's a distinction like we can use institutional power to rein in these corporations that are exploiting us and destroying the planet so I, I guess I just want to say that that's, that's what we, I, I think that's an important thing for us to do. I think it's an important thing for us to talk about our ideas and ideology and principles and values and all that, and then say what policies that means. Like how we have to translate our ideals into policy because that's policies, how the world works. Like, like, just reading, you know, reading about the details of the negotiation of these trade agreements. And, and it's like these, these multilateral trade deals between like where the developing countries are like really trying to negotiate like less, you know, um, extractive and exploitive terms in these multi multilateral you know, international trade deals. But then the, you know, the, the United States comes in and is like, no, the international law is going to be how we fucking say it's going to be. And it, then it is, it is. That's how internet, that's how international law gets made. The most powerful corporations in the United States set international law. Like, so international so we live in a globalized world it's a global comp you know uh, a global village as buckminster fuller said we're in that now and there's policies there's specific rules written down to the very fucking tiny grain detail about how shit's gonna go <laughs> and even the poorest people in the poorest countries in the world who don't benefit, in fact, are very harmed by the terms of those agreements, but they sign on to them anyways, because there are other, you know, enticements that are put in there to, you know, op the opening up of, of international markets that these developing countries who got all their resources stolen from them in the 19th and 20th century by European and American colonialism. Like, so they, they're, Colonialism extracted the resources from these countries and then put in corrupt governments in those countries that it can then negotiate these international trade deals that force the poor, the poorest people in the world who are living out, living on a dollar a day. Like it forces them to have to comply with legal regimes in their countries that were dictated to them by legal regimes in our country, America, especially. And so 
that's why the American government is so important. It's so important that we change American legislation because the, the hyper-capitalism that we have in America is, I mean, has been exported around the world and is still being exported around the world. Like we're still, you know, doing fucking sanctions against Venezuela, trying to destroy Venezuela and punish the poor people living there in order to get them to overthrow their government. Like, United States policy is doing that. Like, some fucking douchebags, rich assholes in America, capitalists, wrote policies, laws, that are working towards the destabilization of a government on another continent because they have a lot of oil that American corporations want to get even though the burning of that oil is destroying the planet. <laughs> like, that's the whole thing. Like, it's, it's so, that's why policy is so important. Like, people are getting fucked. Like, if you think of poor people in America are getting fucked, poor people in all over the world, billions and billions and billions of us are getting fucked. <laughs> like, by policy, by Laws that were written down, codified into law by, you know, albeit corrupted, but at least nominally democratic processes, institutions that are still, you know, given the, given the air of legitimacy by a, um, I'm sorry, I had too many thoughts all at once and <laughs> forgot exactly my train of thought. I don't know. I guess I just policy. Like the the it's no longer enough. Like we're out of time for twiddling our thumbs. Like I'm a philosopher. All my the main thing I care about is the philosophy, the ideas. But I'm a realist in terms of the fact that I know that just the ideas, the philosophy, the I, you know, the the general, the the theory, the the you know, the concepts involved, like that, those aren't enough. Like they, you know, like people often use the phrase "kumbaya" to describe, like you know, when when left, you know, a lot of times when people people on the left who aren't explicitly policy oriented. Um, and even people who don't realize that they're on the left, but like a lot of people in the festival movement who like don't even consider themselves political, they you probably are proud. They probably are proudly apolitical. Um, but a lot of them, you know, like talk about the sacredness, the sacredness of nature, and the you know, and the you know the the fact that we're all god you know like each you know, each person is just another version of ourselves living a different life and having a different experience or you know, all these principles like can be translated into policy and in most cases it's the policies that are the opposite of the policies that are actually running this shit that are actually that all of the all the rules of the game that all of us have to follow are being written by people who believe the exact opposite of, you know, uh, what the conscious culture believes. And so it's not enough um, to, to just be woke. Like, you have to fight for policies. Like, you have to have conversations with people who, like, don't know much. You know, you have to have conversations with, you know, people who, you know, low information voters, really, like, I mean, and I, I get that a lot of people in the festival movement and, you know, people who I, people who, you know, consider themselves conscious, um, a lot of them are low information voters, too. Like, a lot of them just don't know, or, or they think that the whole thing is just so corrupt that there's no point. And that, that, that I'm sympathetic to. I, I can understand people just, you know, giving up on trying to get good policies in place. It's because it's so, it feels so futile because we've, you know, been fighting for these policies for 70 years now. And, 
you know, I guess 50 years at least, uh, 60 years ish, whatever, you know what I mean? Like if, we've been fighting for this shit for so long and, you know, we got the Vietnam war ended, but then all they did was fucking turn around and start another whole bunch of wars. Like we've been still at war ever since like the, the anti-war movement that, you know, rose up and shut down Vietnam. Like, they were like, all right, cool, we won. We got, <laughs> got the Vietnam War ended. But then they just turn around and, like, start doing all these other wars. And, like, <clears throat> I don't know. Like, it matters. It matters, man. It matters who's in charge. Like, so... Anyways, I guess I should wrap this video up, but really, really what I wanted to, but the main point is just that it's not enough to talk about ideas. Like we have to talk about policies and talk about, you know, um, entering the political domain and, you know, fighting for what we believe in so that it can be implemented on the local level, state level, national level, and the global level. Because like I say, international law is written by America. <laughs> like um, America, you know, set up a lot of these things. So um, even, even though we don't deserve a, you know, a bigger voice in international law. Um, we have one. So, um, I feel like that's why it matters even more here that we, we cosmopolitan, cosmop that that we cosmopolitan, woke, future oriented, conscious people, like need to start speaking up more strongly in politics. Uh, and uh, with that all, uh, say goodbye for now. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> or thanks for joining me. <laughs> Love you guys.